カットは意外とたたえあちまたいてぽうないきゃいのいたたえパウヒヒリパウララマパウオテファカーロパウオテタガタパウオテアロハテパウエヘレナイヤタタウマウリオラキアタタウハウミエフイエタイキエナイアナイカフリカフワチテラクキャプイネトリ Thank you, Haniko, for your very moving karakia, and welcome to Talanoa Live, the only live discussion and pre departure event ahead of Yuki Kihara's presentation for New Zealand at the 59th Venice Biennale. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today across continents, waterways, and time zones to dialogue together. And please remember to put your questions in the chat. We're happy to answer almost anything. My name is Natalie King, and I'm a professor of visual arts at the University of Melbourne, primarily working as a curator of contemporary art. I'm wearing a pink shirt with a pattern, and I'm sitting in front of a yellow background with red trimming. I live in Nam, Melbourne. And I would like to acknowledge the Bunwarang as the traditional custodians of the land in which I live and work, and pay my respects to their ancestors and elders, past, present, and emerging. In 2017, I was the curator of the first solo presentation by an Aboriginal artist, Tracy Moffat, for the Australian Pavilion. And now I have the enormous pleasure of working alongside Yuki Kihara as her curator. The Venice Biennale is the most prestigious visual arts event in the world. It's also the oldest. It started in 1895 across the Venetian city、um, in northern Italy. Over 90 countries participate in the Biennale, and attendance swells to around 600,000 people across a seven month exhibition cycle. The exhibitions are held in palazzos, warehouses, Uh, parks, it's across the entire city. So, New Zealand has been participating in the Venice Biennale since 2001, and some of the artists include、uh, Michael Parakofi, Lisa Rehana, and more recently, Dane Mitchell. So, it's a triumph that Yuki Kihara has been selected to represent New Zealand as the first Pacifica, Asian, and Fafa Fine artist. As we count down to our departure. Welcome, Yuki. Kiara and Talafalava, my name is Yuki Kihara. I'm an interdisciplinary artist. And first of all, I would like to acknowledge that Maori people are the indigenous peoples of Aotearoa, New Zealand. It is also the country. That I am humbled to represent at the upcoming 59th Venice Biennale, opening on、uh, 23rd of April of this year.、Um, my exhibition, entitled Paradise Camp,、um, involved over close to 100 people,、uh, which was、uh, shot and filmed、um, across、uh, Upolu Island in Samoa. As well as here in Aotearoa, New Zealand.、Um, I'll be happy to、uh, answer any of your questions、um, that you might have about Paradise Camp or the Venice Biennale a little bit later on. But、um, uh, next, I would like to、uh, introduce you、uh, a very, very talented Pacifica curator, Ioana Gordon Smith. Ioana, take it away.、Oh, thank you, Yuki. Uh, kia ora koutou, talo for lover. Hi, everyone. My name is Ioana Gordon Smith. I'm a Samoan Pakeha curator and arts writer based in Aotearoa. And I have the huge privilege of being the assistant bus speaker curator for Yuki Kihara's Paradise Camp, New Zealand's presentation at the Venice Biennale. My role is supported through Creative New Zealand's Pacific Arts Strategy. 
Um, I'm zooming in from home and I'm wearing a white blouse with my curly hair down to my shoulders and behind me is this vibrant orange paradise camp uh, themed backdrop. And we're all really excited to share with you what we've been working on for the past few years. Uh, so to get our conversation rolling, I'll hand it back to you, Natalie. Thanks, Yuan. You've been an invaluable member of our team. Yuki, you mentioned before about Samoa and you were born in Upolo Island. You lived in Jakarta and Osaka and you went to boarding school in Wellington before attending Wellington Polytechnic in New Zealand. Can you discuss your early ancestry and how you became an interdisciplinary artist? Um, okay, sure. Thanks, Natalie, for the question. So um, my father is Japanese and my mother is Samoan. My parents both met each other in Upolu Island um, in the uh, early 70s. Um, I am the eldest of um, three um, and uh, all three of us, um, uh, live here in Aotearoa together with my dad, and um, I live with my mother um, in uh, Samoa. Um, and I moved back uh, to Samoa uh, 11 years ago, which is where I'm permanently based, uh, live and work. I uh, first migrated to um, Aotearoa in maybe about 1989, and I went to boarding school for three years, and I also attended uh, fashion school. Uh, at Wellington Polytechnic. I actually didn't want to go to fashion school. I actually wanted to go to an art school, but um, my father said there's no money in it. So I said to myself, well, what is, what is a, another industry that I can capitalize on my creativity? Um, and I decided to uh, go to fashion school. But when I was in fashion school, I was very much um, treating fashion school like art school, like, you know, using material as a sculptural material rather than um, pursuing it as a commercial enterprise. And as a result, um, a lot of the, the works that, a lot of the garments that I was producing was very avant-garde and very theatrical. Um, and uh, that eventually led me to uh, working in uh, film and television and uh, performing arts industries. Uh, working as a uh, wardrobe manager, costume designer, uh, and I eventually ventured into uh, working in um, uh, uh, fashion editorials um, and, you know, short stint as a hairdresser. Um, so all of this um, aspects of fashion and, you know, uh, ideas about image making, um, uh, I, you know, ideas about the bodies and representation is something that all kind of feeds into my current practice uh, right now. Um, yes, yeah, so I hope that answered your question. Thanks, Yuki. It's really nice to hear um, your journey from fashion school through to where you are now. Um, I know that you have a long history across all of those um, disciplines of working with your Whafafine communities, both here and in Samoa. I wondered if you could tell us a bit about your your relationship and with Fafafina communities, who they are and, and what they represent for you. Okay, sure. Um, so in the Samoan context, uh, my family uh, acknowledges me as a Fafafine. So Fafafine is one of four genders that's customarily um, culturally acknowledged. Um, so Fafafine, which is myself, um, so uh, a person uh, that is assigned male at birth who expressed their gender in a feminine manner. Uh, we also have fa'atama, uh, which, uh, which are persons assigned female at birth who expressed their gender in a very masculine way. Um, so yeah, so there's, uh, you know, there's four genders in Samoa. Um, and uh, I've done a lot of projects uh, with the Fafafine community. Um, I guess beginning from early 2000, uh, when I staged the first uh, Fafafine beauty pageant at a Kukale nightclub uh, called Banana Court um, in uh, Courtney Place in Wellington. Uh, that was the first um, Fafafine beauty pageant in Wellington, uh, which had only four contestants, but we packed the house. Um, it was great. Um, and then um, following on the success of the first Fafafine beauty pageant with four contestants, we um, uh, hosted another pageant after that. I think we had about maybe six, six or seven. Yeah, it was fun. Um, and then um, I, my, 
work in my work, I'm very much driven to create work that empowers an audience. Um, and I always feel like Fafafine community as an audience has always been neglected. So I really wanted to use this opportunity, um, you know, with the Venice Biennale um, to uh, create a body of work which solely focuses on the Fafafine and Fatama community as a primary audience. Oh, that's so exciting, Yuki, to go from a pageant with four contestants to prioritizing a Fafafine audience in the world's biggest Biennale. Um, actually, could you, Yuki and Natalie, could you tell me both um, a bit about the process of applying to represent the New Zealand Pavilion at the Venice Biennale? What's involved and how did you find out that you were selected? Uh, Natalie, maybe we could start with you. Thanks, Ioana. Well, I first uh, came across Yuki's work. Um, I was aware that she had a solo acquisitive exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York in 2008, which is, of course, enormously prestigious. And following on from that, I was aware that Yuki had exhibited in a number of biennials, including Honolulu, uh, Daegu, Bangkok, and Sakahan in Canada. And Yuki then showed in two Asia-Pacific triennials in Brisbane, and I revisited her work in 2015. And I have to confess, I had longed to work with her ever since. So New Zealand uh, put out an open call in 2019, uh, which is very astute of New Zealand to go out very early and give as much time as possible. Um, and I approached Yuki on social media we had never worked together before, but she rejected me. Right, Yuki? <laughs> I mean, and frankly, I thought it was a joke. I mean, <laughs> well, because, I mean, you know, um, I, I knew that you worked with Tracy Moffat. Um, and, you know, I also um, knew that you're a friend of Tracy's. Uh, you also curated, curated um, Tracy's work at the Australian Pavilion. So, you know, when you first approached me, I was kind of like, are you sure, like, you know, you, you got the right person? Um, and then so prior to uh, Natalie approaching me, I actually attempted to organize uh, my proposal twice. Uh, which both failed because I just didn't have enough time to put everything together. Um, and then, you know, Natalie kept on nudging me. I said, okay, then, you know, um, you know, Natalie, I hope you don't give your hopes up. You know, don't keep, you know, keep your hopes up too much. Um, and then to Natalie's surprise, when I, you know, gave her all the material that I've been working on over the past two years, she said that, Yuki, you're already done 60% of the work. I was like, oh, man, really? Like, yeah. Um, and then, so, you know, we, um, you know, six weeks wasn't enough. I, I don't know if it was six weeks. I think we had six weeks um, to put the proposal together. Um, we were, you know, cutting the deadline, but we managed to submit it. Um, and it was a waiting game for, I think, like two, three months. Um, and then I got this email from Creative New Zealand asking me, with, you know, whether um, you know, I have, a, I, you know, if I had time to Zoom. Um, and then I was um, in Samoa at the time. Um, so, you know, um, I submitted the, uh, the, uh, the proposal from Samoa. Um, and then so, yeah, okay, but, um, you know, what is in re with regards, because it's about logistics and budget, then, you know, I would, you know, I would uh, rather have my um, curator with me so we can, you know, address the proposal. Um, and then, um, yeah, Creative New Zealand um, said that, no, we just want to talk to you. Or we just want to speak to you briefly about your proposal. And I'm saying like, oh, okay, what's this about? Um, and then, so um, I opened up the Zoom screen. And at that time, the commissioner of, uh, 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 the, the commissioner for New Zealand's, um, New Zealand Pavilion was uh, Michael Moynihan. Um, and he asked me how I was doing. I said, yeah, I'm fine, but I was just really nervous. Um, you know, you know, how come he's talking to me very nicely? Um, I was just waiting for the interrogation about my proposal. Um, and he got out this piece of paper and started reading this speech. And I was really like, oh, why are you reading a speech? And it was the end of the speech. He said, Yuki, um, Creative New Zealand would like to formally invite you to represent uh, the New Zealand Pavilion at uh, the next Venice Biennale. Um, and, um, you know, I was calm. 
and collected, and I graciously accepted the invitation to accept, uh, you know, to uh, present uh, Aotearoa New Zealand at the Venice Biennale. And then I um, graciously said goodbye, and I turned up my Zoom screen, and I screamed at the top of my lungs. I was like, oh my gosh, like, is this a dream? I hope it's, you know, if it's a dream, please don't end it. Um, and I screamed at the top of my lungs, and my mom, I just remember, like, my mom's, like, running into my room, hey! I like, how come you're screaming? Why are you screaming? I said, Mom, 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 I'm good. So Venice being Ali. And my mom's like, Oh, fair Venice. Where's Venice? So I had to go and Google image, like, you know, and show like the map of Venice. And then she was like, Come on, Venice. Like, why do you want to go there so far away? So I had to explain to her um, what Venice Biennale was. Um, and then she said, Oh, great. When am I when am I coming with you? Um, so of course, you know, she she, she would like to come, but yeah, but unfortunately, um, I don't think she can because of the, you know, of the borders that are currently closed in Samoa at the moment. Um, but uh, yeah, hopefully, um, you know, when the borders improve, um, you know, I can get her over. But if not, then, you know, I'm, look, I'm also looking forward to the day that I can actually do a paradise camp back to Samoa in 2023. So that's a very long-winded answer, but yeah. <laughs> Yuki, let's turn to Paradise Camp, which is the tantalising title of your exhibition for the Venice Biennale. And as you mentioned before, when you sent me your initial idea, I was struck, it was like curators, um, a curate, curatorial miracle, that you had a fully formulated concept that had been, I guess, gestating for over eight years and involved uh, your community, the Fafa Fine community, um, extensive uh, consultation. Can you tell us about the uh, the concept for Paradise Camp? Okay, sure. So um, if you were a visitor encountering, um, encountering uh, Paradise Camp for the first time, um, what you will um, see is that you are immediately um, taken to a whole other world. Um, this whole other word that is called Paradise Camp. Um, and I would say that Paradise Camp, in a way, is a Fafafine utopia or, you know, uh, a worldview, according to me. Um, and it essentially explores um, the intersectionality between um, uh, identity politics, decolonization, and climate change. Um, uh, which is a, you know, a very layered concept, but um, it also looks at, you know, other um, kinds of um, research that, that I've done uh, where um, the first time I actually thought of Paradise Camp was actually back in 2008 when I had the solo exhibition at the Met. So um, my exhibition at the Met was on the ground floor at the Lila Atchison Wallace Wing. Um, and then uh, when you go to the second floor of the Met, it's where um, their um, exhibition of modern art is presented. Um, and then, you know, when you walk through um, the, the modern art gallery of the Met, it's really like walking through like an art book. Um, and then, um, you know, I was walking past all these paintings of Cezanne and Van Gogh. Um, and I suddenly found a, you know, I saw a painting of uh, Paul Gugan hanging on the wall. Um, and I sat there and I kept on looking at the painting. And, um, and I began to ponder uh, this essay that was written by Ngahuya Tewe Kotoku, um, who uh, presented her essay at a, uh, a Paul Gugan symposium that was hosted by uh, Auckland Art Gallery Toyotamaki in 1992. And then so in Nahuya's essay, she talks about um, the, uh, the, the history of um, indigenous queer culture in the Moana Pacific um, and how um, Gugan uh, may have provided a visual record um, of that through the Tahiti and the Marquesan uh, community. Um, uh, uh, where the, the Fafafini version in French Polynesia is, is called Mahu. Um, and then I kept on looking closer at the paintings and then, um, and I kept on wondering like, how come is it, you know, the models and the background, you know, look just like, you know, how I remember Samoa. 
So I did a bit of like archival research and then, um, and then lo and behold, I actually found um, archival evidence that shows that Gugan was actually inspired by photographs of people, at, people and places um, in Samoa, uh, uh, which were photographs taken by New Zealand colonial photographer Thomas Andrew um, in the um, in the late uh, um, in in the late twentieth uh, century, sorry, in the early twentieth century, um, and then I started to sort of you know uh, put together the pieces of the puzzle, um, and then uh, I've decided that you know I would upcycle um, you know all these uh, series of Gugan paintings, uh, which I felt that was based on um, uh, people and places um, in Samoa and particularly Fafafines. Why don't we look more closely at the lead image to Fafafine, uh, which appears on the cover of our forthcoming publication and has been uh, released at the moment. And in that particular image, if we could please have it up on the screen, uh, Mandolin and Rubenita stand side by side in very brightly coloured lava lavas. Um, for me, it's a very um, dignified and graceful pose Yuki, tell us more about this work. Um, so uh, this work is a work that's been um, upcycled from a painting by Paul Gugan entitled Two Tahitians. Um, and then when I looked at um, the faces of the models in Gugan's paintings, um, it really reminded me of, you know, a lot of, of my Fafafine friends. Um, and then when I went through the process of casting the models, um, you know, uh, you know, in these uh, series of um, uh, missions and photographs, like I knew that Mandolin and Rubenita, you know, were going to be the models, you know, for this uh, particular photograph. Um, so this uh, particular photograph is taken um, in the village of Saliapanga, which is uh, one of five villages um, that uh, uh, Paradise Camp uh, uh, was uh, filmed and photographed. Um, uh, and then, um, yeah, so it's in the southwest uh, of uh, Upolu Island. And it was um, photographed in uh, March of uh, 20, uh, 2020, actually just right before the, um, the global pandemic, which hit us in uh, April 2020. So um, it's great that I was able to... Uh, you know, conduct this massive shoot, which involved, you know, over 80 people, um, because it would have been impossible for me to um, stage a shoot of this scale with all the social distancing measures that we have at the moment. You know, Yuki, as a, as a Samoan woman, as a Moana woman, it gives me immense pride to see Paradise Camp. Um, and it's, it gives me immense pride too to see you representing on the global stage. Does that kind of instill any sense of responsibility in you? Like, do you, what is your uh, feeling about being the first bus speaker, the first Asian and the first Fafafine artist to represent New Zealand at the Biennale Art? Um, for me, I know that um, for a person like myself from a marginalized community to representing a nation at the Venice Biennale, uh, it means that, um, you know, it's shattering all these glass ceilings, you know, that had for so long uh, withheld the, you know, the, the Moana community, the indigenous community, the indigenous um, Fafafine LGBTIQ plus community. Um, and I also want to use this opportunity to swing the door wide open so that there's more of us, um, you know, um, out there, you know, kicking ass basically, um, and I feel like, you know, um, everybody should have the opportunity to represent a country, regardless of their race, their gender, their sexuality, or their ability. Um, and then I hope that, you know, Creative New Zealand or the Arts Council of New Zealand, Toy Aotearoa, you know, uh, keeps presenting firsts in the future um, Aotearoa, Aotearoa New Zealand Pavilion at the Venice Biennale. 
Ioana, can we turn to you? Uh, you've been a really valuable member of our curatorial team uh, with phenomenal research skills contributing to our publication. What are your, some of your observations working on such a complex project like the Venice Biennale that has taken us three years to get to this point? There's a lot involved. <laughs> I'd agree with that. It's been a huge project and it has a lot more um, aspects to it than I think I would have realised without being involved. Uh, but I would say what I really enjoyed about everything is just the opportunity to work with Yuki closely. Um, I was really lucky to be on the set of one of Yuki's photo shoots and being behind the scenes, it's just, it's such a privilege you get to see all of the planning and all of the coordination and all of the detail and to see it come together and then to see it come to life. It's just such a thrill. Uh, but probably my absolute most favorite aspect has uh, been the opportunity to glimpse into Yuki's research. So, you know, a big part of Yuki's practice is seeking out evidence of Moana existence, you know, and, and practices and in, in archives across the world. and to know that those images and materials exist, to know how far they've traveled and where they live now, and to kind of track the historical conditions that have led to their circulation. That's so vital, especially when a lot of that information isn't very accessible. Uh, so that's been really important and something um, that has always kind of been at the core of the whole Venice project for me. And working on it, you also just get to see a little bit of what catches Yuki's attention, which is really nice just to see that creative spark. Um, Yuki, you just have this keen eye and this um, beyond borders approach and you can make these unexpected but really uncanny connections between things. And I think for me, it's a reminder, you know, when you are breaking barriers that sometimes you need to traverse uh, genres and disciplines in order to build this Moana-centric Fafafini centric utopia. So, yeah, I've just really enjoyed shadowing uh, Yuki's process throughout all of this. Thanks, Yuki, for letting me do that. Um, but talking about favorite things and exciting things, Yuki and Natalie, um, what are you looking forward to at Venice? Uh, Yuki, maybe, maybe you can start this one. What am I looking forward to at Venice? I'm looking forward to the day when I can have a moment to myself um, where I can see the exhibition for myself and have a moment for myself with it. I always try and have that kind of personal moment to myself before everybody comes in just to see um yeah just to absorb um the the environment you know um because uh you know exhibition making and is you know is is very personal experience for me um i kind of feel like um you know before the exhibition opens and everybody sees it and you know and everybody writes about it and everybody criticizes about it and everybody talks about it um, I think it's important that artists have a moment to themselves with their own exhibition. Um, so, yeah, I'm looking for that moment where I'll be standing in the Arsenale, in Paradise Camp, just having the whole gallery to myself and then just reflect, you know, of like how far, you know, uh, I've come with the support of Natalie, Joanna. Stephen and Nikki, you know, from Milford Galleries, you know, um, all of my all of my casting crew in Paradise Camp, both in Samoa and here in Aotearoa, um, and all of my friends and family, um, you know, because without the support, I wouldn't I wouldn't be there. Um, and then um, yeah, just you know, wanting to have that moment of reflection to myself, which is which is something I'm really looking forward to. I guess to answer your question, I'm looking forward to two things. One is actually seeing Yuki and her work in situ. Um, we have been tethered to Zoom screens for nearly three years. And I last saw Yuki in person in March 
uh, 2020 in Samoa when I had the privilege of going and meeting with her and her community and seeing, uh, being a witness to the final phase of Paradise Camp. The other thing I'm looking forward to is a Yuki initiative called the First Solidarity, Solidarity Network, which is a cross-pavilion network of firsts. So Yuki is the first Pacifica artist and she has brought together other pavilions such as Albania, Singapore, uh, the UK, uh, there's about five pavilions, Poland, who will come together and um, build solidarity because in my experience with the Venice Biennale, um, the national pavilions are really um, have quite tight borders and they're silos of non-disclosure. So Yuki has developed this initiative where actually we can speak to each other and understand how we're all working in a very similar and complex environment. Yuki, do you want to add to that? Thanks a lot, um, Natalie, for that. So yes, um, the first Solidarity Network is really a, uh, an informal network that brings together you know, uh, artists and curators, um, installers and commissioners of um, uh, partnering Solidarity Pavilions to really um, uh, share our experiences with each other, give each other tips, um, uh, and uh, you know, be able to share our resources and share our audiences, and to also you know maximize you know our time together at the Venice Biennale that's running you know for seven months. Um, so we already have a uh, informal gathering planned um, in Venice a uh, week before the um, the Venice opening, but there's going to be more activities um, between the Solidarity Pavilion. Solidarity Pavilions um, uh, throughout the uh, seven month cycle of the exhibition. So watch this space. Uh, turning to the topic of pavilions, uh, Paradise Camp will be presented in the Atenale. Uh, that's a process with the New Zealand Pavilion in terms of finding a venue, finding a location for presentation. Yuki, Natalie, can you talk a bit about your first trip to Venice together? and what it was like to, to try and locate somewhere for Paradise Camp. Uh, Natalie, let's start with you. Well, uh, New Zealand doesn't have a permanent pavilion, so actually it's fortuitous for the artist because a site and location can be chosen that um, really is in sync with the actual work. So in uh, November 2019, Yuki and I and Jude Chambers from Creative New Zealand went to New Zealand, went to Venice, but we arrived the day after Aqua Alta, which is the enormous, epic, sort of biblical flood in Venice, and it was one of the most significant ones. So um, it was very complicated traversing the city, but we looked at many different venues and we made a unanimous decision to present Yuki's work in the Arsenale, which is one of the very prime venues as part of the Venice Biennale. So there will be uh, very extensive audiences and foot traffic through that particular space. So we're super excited. Um, so I've actually been to the Venice Biennale twice. Um, and I'm not sure uh, what year these artists were exhibiting at the time, but I was at the Venice Biennale when Michael Parikofi was exhibiting. Um, I'm not sure if it was 2009, and I think it was 2011. Um, yeah, don't count me on this, but um, which is when um, uh, Francis Pritchard and uh, Judy, um, Judy Miller was um, exhibiting. Um, and I exhibited this, um, I, sorry, I visited uh, both of these pavilions in uh, two different times, you know, in, in July in the summertime. Um, so I didn't come across the Aqua Alta at all. So um, it was great, you know, when uh, Natalie told me to make sure that I take, you know, my pair of gum boots. Um, and then, you know, sure enough, thank God, I actually packed my, you know, my gum boots because the water was really coming up just below my knee. Um, but, you know, you soldier on, you know, despite the, the aqua alta, we walked around everywhere around Venice in our gumboots looking for the, the right venue that we can present 
Paradise Camp. Um, and I have to say that I'm very confident in this Arsenali venue um, because um, it's not only a central location, but uh, it's also um, the entrance way to the series. Um, the entrance, it's a, it's an, uh, so Paradise Camp is actually um, situated um, at the first pavilion that you walk into when you walk into the entrance that you encounter all these series of other um, uh, national pavilions in this long wing. Um, so, yeah, so I hope everybody can can come and experience Paradise, Paradise Camp um, in the Arsenali. Yuki, um, presenting and representing New Zealand at the Venice Biennale is such a sort of career apex. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on how to have a career that is sustainable beyond the Venice Biennale. What, what have you got planned? Um, what have I got planned? Actually, a lot of things, because um, uh, prior to actually, you know, for us being um, selected to represent um, Aotearoa at the Venice Biennale, I already had a five-year project that was already underway, which is called, um, which is a five-year project uh, entitled Samoa no Uta, or, or song, a song from Samoa, which is a series of um, kimono sculptures um, uh, where the kimonos are made from the, the, the siapo or the Samoan bar cloth. Um, which uh, you know, which explores the the social and political relationship between Japan and the Moana, and specifically Japan and Samoa, and it's also drawn from my own um, interracial, interracial heritage as well. Um, so that project is already underway before Venice Biennale came into place. Um, so that project ends in 2023. Um, there is uh, new work uh, that is going to be presented at the upcoming uh, Aotearoa Art Fair uh, that's going to be held in Tamaki Makoro here in New Zealand. Um, and then um, all these new bodies of work um, coming out. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm really, really grateful that, um, you know, I have a really, you know, wonderful people in my production team um, that's helping me, you know, create these um, amazing new bodies of work. You definitely have a lot on. <laughs> you're forging lots of new pathways, Yuki, and as you kind of described before, you're swinging the door open for lots of other firsts to come after you. With that in mind, I was wondering what advice you might have for younger artists, and in particular, what advice you might have for younger Basvika or queer artists. Okay. Uh, what, would be, what would be my advice? Uh, my advice would be... Um, to know who your audience is and, um, you know, who is it that you want to empower through what you do? You know, what, who is the, and how do you want this audience to, to benefit from, from your, you know, from your work? Um, so I think once you are clear in that, then I think everything will, will um, fall into place. I would say that um, uh, perseverance and dedication is um, really important because you're gonna get knocked back almost all the time, but uh, you just have to keep persisting because you know I feel like you know if I can do it, I think anybody can do it. Yeah. So take chances and make lots of mistakes and don't be afraid to fail because failure guides you to where success is. I think it's fair to say you're completely unassailable and um, I've found that two people who come from completely different backgrounds who come together can almost accomplish anything with tremendous support. Um, there are some wonderful questions coming in so I thought we might close our discussion before we turn to the audience questions. Um, if, Yuki, I wonder if you can talk about uh, intersectionality and what that means to you in the context of Paradise Camp. Okay, um, so in the context of Paradise Camp, um, looking at the intersectionality between identity politics, decolonization, and climate change. So there is a time where um, 
the intersectionality between environmental crisis and, and uh, Fafafine identity is really in the post um, environmental crisis where um, like, for example, uh, back in uh, 2009, um, when a huge tsunami uh, struck um, uh, the island of Upolu, um, one of the first, um, one of the spurs, one of the spur, uh, sorry, one of the first responders to the tsunami were a group of Fafafines uh, based in uh, Alipaza. Um, and then, you know, they were, um, you know, helping to rescue people, you know, they were comforting the elderly, you know, they were settling in the families with young children, uh, you know, they were out there, you know, pulling the bodies from the debris, so on and so forth. But um, when it came to the group of Fafafines seeking, um, you know, uh, 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 housing at the emergency shelter, the emergency shelters uh, didn't have any gender neutral bathrooms, uh, which meant that the group of Afafines had to go and find a abandoned house, um, uh, you know, for the time being while they continue on with their rescue efforts. So they basically put their lives at, at risk, um, you, know, uh, you know, while trying to save the life of others. And then, so this is where, you know, you know, this um, intersectionally uh, intersectionality happens between, you know, environmental crisis and Fafafine where, um, you know, when we look at, um, you know, climate change, environmental crisis and disaster risk, risk management, you know, a lot of the policies around that are actually framed, you know, within the Western man-woman binary divisions, you know, that doesn't allow for other kinds of, um, um, identities or voices to come through. Um, and then, so this is one of many aspects that I'm exploring in uh, Paradise Camp. Thank you. There are some really terrific questions coming through from the audiences. Yuki, the first question is, what's something you've learned from COVID? Has it changed you or your work at all or the ideas behind your work? Um, I would have to say, say that, you know, during the lockdown, it was kind of like a blessing because one, I was absolutely exhausted from, um, from the shoot in Samoa. So, um, you know, after we did the shoot in Samoa, you know, Natalie, when you went back to Melbourne and I came to, you know, to, to Auckland to pursue, you know, another Paradise Camp project and the lockdown happened, I kind of have to say, oh my gosh, I can finally catch my breath because I was so exhausted because you know, we've been on, on this production in Samoa for like what, for three, four months, you know, so it's great to have the time to, to rest um, and actually, um, you know, think about the next project of the next phase of Paradise Camp, which took place in Auckland. Um, and I have to say that it also allowed me more time to research um, my work so that I can uh, establish more, you um, intersectional layers and meanings into my work as well, to imbue them with the work that I'm making. Um, and another thing that I've learned, you know, during my time, you know, during the COVID lockdown is actually patience. And then um, learning how to be still. Um, and then, um, and yeah, learning how to be still. I hope that makes sense. It does, Yuki. Um, thank you, everyone, by the way, for all of your questions. Please do keep sending them through and we'll, we'll hopefully get to them. Um, I'm going to read the next question from my screen, Yuki, because it's quite an important one and I want to make sure I capture it correctly. So the question is, Talo for lava, Yuki. You do amazing work to carry our identities and lived experiences into cisgender white areas slash spaces that would never have our Indigenous queer bodies exist let alone exhibit and headline. Do you find the culture changing in fine arts museums towards true respect for Indigenous queer and minority art, or is there just the acceptance and popularity of it because of its, quote, exotic and different, end quote, uh, end quote, approach? How do we continue to respectfully step into these spaces? Thank you very much for that question. I would say that the second part is most truthful. 
I would say that, um, I mean, yes, you know, I'm the first Fafa Fini to represent a country at, you know, at the Venice Biennale, but it shouldn't stop at me, you know, it should keep going. Um, and, um, and I feel like I am not the peak of this movement. I feel like, you know, I'm helping to push it, but I don't think we've actually, you know, um, really swung the door open yet. You know, that's what I'm trying to do. But um, I don't think it should, you know, start and finish with me. I think there should be more of us um, coming through. Um, one of the uh, the things that, that I've stipulated uh, with the touring of Paradise Camp is that, the, uh, you know, I can only allow institutions, you know, to host the presentation of Paradise Camp post Venice Biennale, um, so long as they actually have gender neutral bathrooms, because Paradise Camp is primarily made for the Fafafine and Fatsama community, right? And then so if that tours everywhere, um, you know, I don't want my primary audience, you know, being, um, um, you know, being um, ignored, you know, by institutions that are not actually making way to um, embrace every kind of audience, including the Fafafine Fatsama you know, Takatapui, LGBTIQ plus community. Um, so, um, you know, so, you know, that's a lot of the, like the behind the scenes stuff that a lot of people might not know about is that, you know, the true kopapa and the mana of Paradise Camp is that, yes, it's glamorous and it's amazing to have all this credibility and all this um, amazing media exposure and all of that. But I'm also trying to use Paradise Camp in a much more, more socially, uh, politically responsible way um, by actually encouraging uh, international galleries and museums, um, you know, to, um, you know, to, um, to be much more accommodating to diverse um, audiences, including um, trans, gender non-binary, fa'afafine, fa'asama, and takatapwe, leiti, fa'akasalewalewa, MPV, fa'af, um, communities. Thanks, Yuki. I think it's um, certainly true that we rise by lifting others and you're certainly paving the way. The next question is, what advice would you give to your younger self if that were possible? Would you do anything differently? Well, sounds like, you know, I mean, like RuPaul's Drag Race or something, because I remember that question. I have to say it's a very sensitive one um, because, you know, when I was a child, I was, you know, I was um, always in and, out of, in and out of hospital because I was a physically weak child. I was in and out of hospital. Um, I was always getting sick. Um, and, um, and then I have to say that, you know, my... I mean, my parents today have come around to the fact that, you know, I'm, a, I'm an artist and, and a fa'afafine. But back then, um, I don't think my parents was really sure um, what kind of future I was going to have. But I mean, look at me now. I mean, you know, fabulous now. Um, but, um, but my advice, it's not necessarily to my younger self, but my advice is really to the parents of um, Fa'afafine Fa'atamai LGBTIQ plus uh, community that um, please give them a chance, you know, please do not disown them. And look at me, you know, I am a Fa'afafine. I was assigned male at birth and I express my gender, you know, in, in a feminine manner. I'm a trans woman and I am representing the Aotearoa New Zealand Pavilion at the Venice Biennale. So, Think about that before you start cursing your fa'afafine um, fa'atamai LGBTIQ plus takatapui children, because every children is gifted with a talent. So please give them a chance. Oh, that's so important, Yuki. I think it's nice to remember that this project is important not just for artists, but for entire families as well. So yeah, thank you for that question. Um, the next and world peace <laughs> pageants <laughs> um, the next question for you Yuki is you've travelled and exhibited around the world 
Are you surprised that people connect with you or your art, even if they're from different backgrounds or cultures? You know, what's really interesting is that um, you know, I've, you know I've, I've been to many places around the world, you know, traveled with my artwork. And it really amazes me that, you know, just by being myself and in talking about the place that I live, that I know about, um, although I meet people from all around the world, they might not know where the Moana is. They might not know where Samoa is, or they might not even know where Aotearoa is, but it's the specificity that makes it universal. I really believe that because once you actually start generalizing, then it, it kind of evaporates and it doesn't really um, catch people because I think it's in the specificity that people begin to find the nuances of, um, of the work and, and in how they could um, engage with it. So maybe perhaps it's a, like another tip um, that I could offer to artists is that, you know, is to be true to yourself. And you'll find, or be true to yourself, and then you'll always find an audience. So this question probably extends the eye, um, the question about audiences. Will we get to see this fascinating exhibition here? Yes, so Paradise Camp is coming to Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, I can't tell you where, um, but uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a very big secret and a big surprise. But yes, Paradise Camp is coming to Aotearoa, New Zealand. It is coming to Australia. It is coming to Samoa. And it's also going to be touring all around the world. Um, but I can't just give you the information just yet. So please uh, keep in touch with us on www.nzatvenice.com where you can uh, be updated on um, all the, you know, all the, the in and outs and all the amazing updates that are currently um, happening with uh, Paradise Camp. So please do follow us on all the social media platforms. Nice. Um, Yuki, we've spoken before about how you're not just taking yourself to Venice, but you're taking your community with you as well. Uh, in terms of your community, who inspires you? Who inspires me? Um, actually, um, Fafafinas inspire me. Um, I would say that, you know, when I was a child and I was really insecure, I used to look up to Fafafinas like Cindy of Samoa. Um, and because, you know, she was tall, she could sing, she could entertain, she could make people laugh, you know, she was brave. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of people out there in Samoa that know who Cindy of Samoa is. Um, and, you know, and she's been in the game for so long. You know, that's another person that I think people should ask, you know, you know, how you can, you know, maintain, you know, a career as an entertain as a drag entertainer you know, in a very tough business. Um, so um, Cindy Samoa, and then you know what? The thing is, is that if it wasn't, if it wasn't for COVID, Cindy will be performing at the opening of the New Zealand Pavilion at the Venice Biennale, really. You know, like I, I was so gutted, you know, when I had to tell her that, you know, she wasn't able to come because of, you know, all the COVID restrictions, but hopefully she can, you know, perform for us, you know, post, um, Venice Biennale, you know, when um, when our Paradise Camp tours um, all around the world. Thank you, Yuki. This is a really great question. Um, do you have writers or theorists that have been deeply impacted uh, your research and artistic journey? Thank you for that question. I would have to say that um, it will be Coco Fusco, um, the Cuban uh, American uh, contemporary artist. Um, I was very fortunate to meet her through Jim Viviare um, when uh, University of Auckland brought her um, as, a, um, as, a, as a scholar in residence. Um, and then, um, yeah, and I, I met with her. Um, I actually didn't know who she was when I first met her because um, it, 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 there was a Coco Fusco um, symposium that was hosted by the art history department of the University of Auckland. And I was brought in as a guest speaker. 
So prior to coming into Coco Fusco Symposium, I didn't know who she was. Um, but um, after I'd met her, um, you know, we, we became friends. You know, um, I read her book, uh, English is Broken Here, um, which is the book that I constantly go back to. Um, and uh, it's, you know, I know that that book is very famous for publishing, um, you know, uh, a chapter on intercultural performance um, uh, with her collaborative performance with Aguiromo uh, Gomez Pena, with the, um, with the discovery of Amerindians, but there are other, um, you know, chapters, you know, in, in the publication, I feel that is just as relevant or even more relevant um, uh, in, in today's context. Yuki, another question that has come through. Um, you've talked a lot about firsts today, firsts today, which in a way speaks to legacy. Uh, looking to a Venice Biennale five iterations from now, uh, what do you hope to see by means of representation and artistic practice? Um, I guess, you know, just like what I've said before that, you know, in five Venice Biennale times, you know, that, you know, Aotearoa New Zealand keeps presenting firsts of everything. And I would encourage other countries to do the same, to keep presenting firsts, you know, to move away from um, the conventional um, uh, modes of representation and then to, to truly be um, exploratory, diverse, um, you know, to in order for us to fully understand um, the scope of our humanity. And Yuki, this is our final question. Uh, what do you hope people will take away from your exhibition? Is there one thing you would want people to come away with? One thing that I would like people to come away with um, when they visit Paradise Camp is that I really want them to feel empowered. I really want them to feel empowered. I really feel like, you know, they are armed with something amazing um, and ready to walk out of that arsenal and ready to kick ass, you know, ready to take on the world um, and to, uh, to be able to feel good about yourself and to and to yeah to live in a live in a, live an authentic life live an authentic life that is really the crust of what paradise camp is about is living your authentic life living your authenticity that's what i would like people to come away from paradise camp i think that's the absolute perfect moment to bring the talanoa to a close living an authentic life um, which of course you have been doing and inspiring many of us. Thank you, Ioana and Yuki, for joining uh, me here tonight. Um, and thank you, everyone, for attending Talanoa Live. Um, we're so pleased you could join us. And thank you for all of your very thoughtful and insightful questions. We really appreciate it. We hope that you're enthusiastic about Paradise Camp. Uh, you can learn more at the New Zealand at Venice website and please sign up for our newsletter. Big thank you to Platform Interpreting New Zealand uh, for supporting uh, this Talanoa with signing. We really appreciate your efforts. This event was made possible with the support of Auckland Live and presented in partnership with The Big Idea. Thank you both for supporting us. And remember, there's just one month till Paradise Camp is presented at the Venice Biennale. So please follow our social media channels. Uh, we're on New Zealand at Venice on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. We would like to make a special shout out to Heather Byrne, our Senior Communications Advisor at Creative New Zealand, for her tireless effort in bringing Talanoa Live to all of you. And now I'd like to hand over to Haniko, who will close the event with the karakia. Thank you, Haniko.
kia katito tātou hui me inoi tātou. Nā te kukune, ko te pūpuke. Nā te pūpuke, ko te hihiri. Nā te hihiri, ko te mahara. Nā te mahara, ko te hine naru. Nā te hine naru, ko te manaku. Kā hua ko te wānana, haumie, hui e, tāiki e.